Hello. Uh, this video lecture will be looking at uh, the role of media and popular culture in the reproduction of inequality. Uh, sort of continuing with the previous two lectures, which have been about um, how inequalities are reproduced in society. So I'm going to go to the screen share now, pull up our PowerPoint. Um, so yeah, the question, the key question for this lecture is going to be how are social inequalities reproduced through stereotypical representations that circulate in the media and popular culture. Uh, the key concepts that we'll be utilizing that specifically come from Marxist theory uh, will be the concept of ideology and hegemony. And we will be utilizing some of the uh, assigned readings and I'll be talking about a uh, assigned film for the class. So um, we'll be looking at Gregory Mantisios's, uh article on media magic, making class invisible. Uh, I'll be talking about the film Latinos Beyond Real. And we'll also look at the article called Jezebel at the Welfare Office. So um, to begin with our concept of ideology, which I introduced uh, a few lectures previously when talking about theory, um, because it's a key idea within uh, Marx and, and Marxist theory, the concept of ideology. Um, here we're gonna talk about ideology as a set of cultural values, beliefs, and attitudes that legitimate and justify the dominance of the powerful. And ideology is a key part of how social inequalities are reproduced. So again, keeping with this theme of the social reproduction of inequality. So for example, um, just when it comes to the question of race, uh, the systems of racial inequality in the United States rely on ideologies that include judgments about racial differences uh, in order to maintain white privilege. We'll be looking at a number of examples of racial stereotyping um, as forms of ideology that both historically and in the present have served to uh, reproduce and legitimate white supremacy. We'll also be talking about systems of class inequality, uh, and these also rely on ideologies that include valuing the rich over the poor to uphold class privilege, just as ideologies based on male superiority maintain systems of sex and gender inequality. Ideologies typically work by making socially constructed inequalities appear to be natural, timeless, inevitable, or even God-given. This is the sort of common thread <clears throat> in all of these forms of ideology that have to do with race, class, and gender, is that in each instance, they take something that is actually socially constructed, like racial inequality, gender inequality, class inequality, something that is socially constructed, and they make it seem as if it's a natural process, uh, something rooted in biology, um, something that is timeless in the sense of being outside of history, uh, something that is inevitable in the sense that it cannot be resisted, um, and sometimes even as if it's God-given in the sense of it being handed down through religion. So in, in all of these cases, things that are actually socially constructed and therefore can be changed by society come to appear under the spell of ideology as if they were natural, as if they cannot be changed, uh, as if they are uh, rooted in biology or God's will or some other force that is outside the capability of human beings to change them. So that is the sort of the, the work that ideology does in terms of justifying social inequalities by making them seem as if they're natural or supernatural in their um, origins. 
um, <clears throat> the concept of ideology, uh, as we talked about in the previous theoretical lecture, uh, was really developed. It wasn't invented, but it was certainly um, developed by Marx and Engels in their work that came to be known as the German ideology. And in the German ideology, Marx and Engels defined ideology in terms of how the ruling class maintains power, uh, emphasizing their ownership of the means of mental production. So as we talked about in the theoret previous theoretical lecture, the idea of the means of production or the mode of production is a key concept for uh, Marx uh, and Marx and Engels' historical materialism. And here, when it comes to ideology, they talk about the means of mental production. So here we could talk about, we could think about the educational system or um, the, uh, you know, the established church, um, or certainly in our case, the media and popular culture are all of these, these are examples of the means of mental production. And in the German ideology, Marx and Engels say, the ideologies of the ruling class are in every epoch, the ruling ideas, i.e. the class, which is the ruling material force of society is at the same time, it's ruling intellectual force. The class which has the means of material production at its disposal has control at the same time over the means of mental production so that thereby, generally speaking, the ideas of those who lack the means of mental production are subject to it. So what this long passage is basically saying here is, is that the ruling class by virtue of their wealth and power and their ownership of the means of material production have the power to shape the dominant ideas that circulate in society and that those ideas tend to justify, legitimate, uh, to give sanction to their rule. Uh, they seem to be in their interest. And a key part of how this comes to be and why this is, according to this passage, is because of their ownership of the means of mental production. And that has certainly historically been the case with the media, um, which has historically, you know, virtually since its inception, been dominated by a handful of multinational corporations and conglomerates, um, you know, that, that basically own and control uh, almost all of the news uh, and, you know, uh, entertainment and all of the various forms of media apparatus that exist worldwide. Um, we're also gonna utilize this concept known as hegemony, which I have not previously introduced um, in any other lectures. <laughs> in Marxist theory, the term hegemony describes a struggle for power between coalitions of social classes or uh, historical blocks. Hegemony is won and maintained not only through economics and politics, but also through culture, through beliefs, perceptions, values, and mores. Culture is a key element to the struggle for hegemony, um, which is in essence, the struggle to rule and exercise power. The ruling class maintains hegemony to the extent that its worldview becomes the accepted cultural norm. This perspective suggests that policies and sociopolitical processes that are in the best interests of the ruling class are somehow also in the best interests of everyone else. The hegemonic worldview misre misrepresents the social, political, and economic status quo as natural, inevitable, and eternal. So as this uh, second sentence is suggesting here, what happens is that the particular interests of the ruling class 
are presented as if they are in the interests of everyone in the society, as if we all benefit from their rule, uh, as if it basically couldn't be any other way, um, as if it's always been that way and it's always going to be that way that, you know, this ruling class dominates over all the rest of uh, people in society. The way that, um, for example, one uh, automobile executive put it, uh, you know, a number of decades ago, but it's it's still a valid example of this kind of thinking. He said, um, what's good for General Motors is good for America. So in other words, basically, what is good for the capitalist class uh, is good for everyone else in society. That's what we're talking about as far as a hegemonic perspective in which the particular interests of a ruling class are universalized to seem as if they're in the interests of everyone else in the society. And that hegemonic worldview, again, takes things that are socially constructed, like the economic and political status quo, and represents them as if they are natural, uh, inevitable, uh, eternal, timeless, outside of history, um, and therefore cannot be changed. The concept of hegemony was initially defined uh, by Lenin and other Russian Marxists, uh, but it was the Italian Marxist named Antonio Gramsci, who's pictured here in the slide, um, who expanded the use of the concept of hegemony to describe what Gramsci defined it as the intellectual and moral leadership over society. So in other words, to exercise hegemony, to have hegemony was to have the intellectual and moral leadership uh, over the entire society. Um, but that is something that Gramsci says is uh, that doesn't come automatically to the ruling class, that the ruling class has to actively try to cultivate that intellectual and political uh, and, and moral leadership, um, and that they're also um, constantly in, in danger of, of losing their uh, hegemonic power in that sense. So they have to always sort of reaffirm and reestablish it. So Gramsci, as he developed um, this concept of hegemony, uh, talked about power as a mixture of coercion and consent, uh, and that hegemony is essential for the uh, for the latter, for the for the maintenance of consent. Um, so for uh, Gramsci, hegemony explains how the powerful gain consent of the powerless. Uh, Gramsci called it the spontaneous consent of the masses. So how the people who are dominated, exploited, and oppressed in society are persuaded or manipulated in one way or another to give consent to the ruling class uh, that dominates them. So Gramsci tried to explore a number of ways in, you know, religion or in nationalism or in culture, uh, the way in which hegemony provided this function of securing the spontaneous consent of the masses. Uh, he further goes on to say that hegemony involves the capacity to define the common sense and to represent the general interests of everyone in society. So as we talked about in the previous slide, you know, the ability for a particular ruling class to represent the general interest, the universal interests of everyone in society, and in a way that makes it seem like it's commonsensical, you know, like that it's just common sense that um, these people should be in power and everyone else should be uh, subordinate to them. Again, it makes it seem like it's God's way or biology's way or, you know, just the way it's always been. Um, and yet Gramsci was also emphasizing that hegemony is a struggle uh, 
rather than an achievement. Uh, there is always resistance and competing forms of culture that challenge the ruling class. Um, Gramsci himself had been an active part of this sort of resistance. You may notice that this book is called Selections from the Prison Notebooks because he wrote this material while he was dying in a fascist prison uh, in Italy. Uh, he had been imprisoned by Mussolini uh, in 1926 and spent the rest of his time writing in prison uh, as a political prisoner, trying to think about these questions about revolution and hegemony and sort of what had gone wrong, uh, why the fascists had ended up taking power in Italy instead of uh, the workers, uh, why, you know, it is that history had taken this turn. Um, Gramsci was forced to meditate on those questions while he was essentially being left to rot away in uh, a fascist prison in Italy. Um, so the, the first sort of example we can think of um, is a reading that was assigned a, a few weeks back, um, but I think is, is a pretty applicable um, analysis in terms of how class inequalities are maintained and uh, become, uh, you know, hegemonic through the media. And this is the article uh, by Gregory Mancios called Media Magic, Making Class Invisible. Uh, Mancios examines how media shape how people think about each other and society at large, and specifically how the media shapes our perceptions of social class. So Mancios kind of begins with this um, observation about the power of the media to shape how we see other people and, and view our society at large and uh, kind of hones in on the question of social class in terms of how the media presents poor people versus rich people uh, and then versus the, the middle class. In terms of the main themes of media coverage of poverty and poor people, um, Mancios breaks this down into a number of headings. Uh, the poor do not exist or the poor are faceless. So, you know, the, the sort of the first facts of the media is, is that generally speaking, the poor are kind of like out of sight, out of mind. Um, they're uh, deeply underrepresented in media and, and especially in popular culture. Um, and when they are talked about, it's often in this kind of faceless way, of uh, just, you know, kind of statistics or presenting, you know, problems, um, but not really sort of giving voice to people's everyday experiences and their struggles with poverty. Um, going deeper, he talks about the poor are presented as undeserving, um, or as an eyesore, uh, that the poor have only themselves to blame. And here we, we come upon some really familiar ideological narratives uh, that basically blame the victim. Um, how there's this sort of implicit idea that uh, the United States is the land of opportunity and everyone has equal opportunity to be upwardly mobile. And so if you can't get ahead, that's your own fault. Um, that there's some kind of deficiency with your character or deficiency with your morals or your upbringing. You don't work hard enough. You didn't stay in school. You know, all of these various ways in which uh, the poor are blamed for their poverty, uh, in which there is this kind of narrative that therefore, you know, justifies the system, uh, justifies the class inequalities by saying, well, you know, it's it's not that the, the, the game is is rigged against them. It's that uh, they just uh, don't have what it takes to get ahead. Um, and so it kind of lets the system off the hook and uh, puts the uh, focus of blame 
onto the individuals, onto the uh, the people who are the victims of the system. And then, you know, if you have this, this sort of like the, the also the poor are down on their luck, you know, kind of narrative that's a bit more, um, you know, kind of like oriented around charity and can be kind of like patronizing, you know, seeing uh, the poor people as, you know, just um, like unfortunate and um, but still from a, a sense of like kind of condescending distance. When he compares things then to um, looking at how the media cover the poor and uh, compares that with, with that of the, the wealthy and the middle class, he arrives at a different set of conclusions. In looking at the main themes of the media coverage of the wealthy, he talks about the theme that the wealthy are us uh, and that the wealthy as a class do not exist. So this, in this case, it kind of like more kind of like minimizes the, the distance between, you know, the 1% um, and the rest of us uh, it kind of suggests, you know, like that the, the, the wealthy put on their pants one leg at a time, just like the rest of us. And, and these kind of narratives um, that are meant to, you know, kind of soften or even uh, totally eliminate class inequalities. Um, also, the idea that the wealthy are fascinating and benevolent, you know, like the news stories about the the glamour and the lifestyles of the rich and famous um, or about their sort of good natured um, charity and benevolence and the way that they you know, sort of give back to the community. You know, all of these stories are are mobilized, um, sometimes even more aggressively weaponized uh, as ways to legitimate uh, the class inequalities that we see. Um, and then when there are problems and scandals and uh, corruption and things like that, the focus then turns towards the frame of the wealthy include a few bad apples. So, you know, when uh, we have these kind of scandalous um, instances of, of greed or, or negligence, um, this phrase, uh, a few bad apples, is meant to say, well, it's not a problem with the class system. It's just these particular individuals within it. Um, and that's a way, again, of, of, of getting the system off the hook and a way of kind of deferring uh, responsibility and blame from uh, the, the class system and the sort of the greed that's built into the class system and say, well, it's just, you know, uh, a couple of bad apples. The main themes in the media coverage of the middle class um, again, are to sort of like the middle class is us, you know, meaning like that the, the media almost has like a, a an implicit assumption that their uh, audience is all, you know, middle class people, um, you know, in, in a way that, that they do not assume that they're poor or that they're blue collar working class or anything like that. It's kind of directed to like the middle class is is the the norm in society um there are certainly stories about the middle class as a victim um here often the story is like that the middle class are being victimized by like the poor uh, by people you know who are wanting a handout in the form of welfare or people that you know are causing their taxes to go up or you know, the ways that like the middle class is getting um, squeezed, but it's usually um, in a way that says that the middle class is somehow being victimized by those who are uh, lower on the class uh, inequality um, hierarchy, because those people need, you know, handouts and assistance and, you know, all this sort of thing. And the middle class is often presented as the beleaguered victim uh, of that system. And then finally, the middle class is not a working class. 
um, the way in which like the media kind of divides uh, working people into this layered sort of hierarchy that especially distinguishes between like more white collar professionals um, who are, you know, more highly educated and so forth and separates them from uh, more blue collar, uh, more like manual laborers, uh, folks who are less educated. Um, and so it kind of perpetuates this divide within, you know, the 99% of people who um, survive through their labor and, you know, makes this kind of distinction uh, between the middle class and, and the working class and, and upholds that distinction. So um, those are instances we could talk about as um, examples of how ideology reproduces the class system. Um, with this film and, and some of the other readings, we want to look too at how ideology uh, plays out in reproducing racial inequalities. And so I've assigned this film to you called Latinos Beyond Real, challenging a media stereotype, uh, drawing on the insights of Latino scholars, journalists, and community leaders, as well as actors, directors, and producers. The filmmakers uncover a pattern of misrepresentation and underrepresentation. The film examines the underrepresentation and marginalization of Latinos in the U.S. media. So that is to say that in the media and entertainment, Latinos tend to appear, if at all, as gangsters and Mexican bandits uh, or as harlots and prostitutes, uh, drug dealers and welfare leeching illegals. Latino actors and actresses often play only marginalized roles in the media, such as maids, over-sexualized women, and thieves. So it's kind of like the first fact that you need to know about the representation of Latinos in, in, um, in the media is how uh, it, there's this underrepresentation, this this absence you know, uh, Latinx people are now the largest um, uh, minority group in the United States. Um, and yet you wouldn't know it by looking at uh, television or films or, you know, any of the other apparatuses of the media. There's sort of systematic underrepresentation. Um, and when there is representation, it tends to be in these kind of negative stereotypical ways. That's what the film is trying to show you um, is, is that, you know, the, the, the combination of underrepresentation and, and misrepresentation. And it also examines very closely the impact that this has on young people. Um, you'll see in the film, there are a lot of children that are interviewed um, and uh, they talk, you know, basically about like, the lack of role models and the lack of representation, you know, the lack of people that look like them on TV and, and in the movies. And um, when they do see, uh, when they are represented, it, it often is in these kind of harmful stereotypical ways. The filmmakers argue that this has an especially detrimental impact on kids. So, uh, as the film sort of continues, there were many stereotypes of Latinx people in early Hollywood movies, um, such as the so-called lazy Mexican, the Latin lover, and the subservient working class man or woman. However, the most pervasive and dangerous stereotype has been the Latino criminal. The early Hollywood stereotype of the Mexican bandit has declined, but it has evolved into more current stereotypes of drug dealers or gang members um, in, you know, the continuing theme of like violent criminality. So as you'll see, the film takes a historical perspective, goes back all the way to some of the earliest Hollywood movies 
um, to show uh, this sort of stereotyping, especially um, around stories about the American West and like cowboy movies and, you know, anything that involved um, the American uh, war against Mexico or any of those kinds of historical events, the ways in which they uh, were just these consistently stereotypical representations of Mexican people. Um, and so that historical perspective, you know, sort of continues. Uh, they look at, you know, these sort of early ho Hollywood Westerns, such as Red River, starring John Wayne, which eff effectively rewrote history to justify U.S. seizure of land from Mexico as a matter of manifest destiny. So here again, we have um, the way in which like ideology has been used uh, to uh, justify and to legitimate this, you know, massive seizure of Mexican land that happened in 1848 um, to make it seem as if it was again, a matter of manifest destiny, a, a matter of something that was natural, or in this case, like God given. Um, and so again, we have a, you know, a pretty clear example of how empire and, and imperialism becomes justified in these kind of ideological ways through, you know, um, Hollywood Westerns and, and through the sort of rewriting of history uh, through culture. Uh, some of the later examples that the film talks about uh, to do with the film Fort Apache, the Bronx uh, in 1981 was met with protests and the threat of lawsuits from local community groups who threatened to file suit against the producers because of the way it depicted their neighborhood in the Bronx and for the depiction of ethnic minorities, uh, Blacks and Latinos. Uh, this, so this was a time when they're really kind of uh, filmmakers were really kind of exploiting places like the Bronx uh, when they were, you know, economically in a, a downward spiral and, uh, you know, sort of making them as if they were these, you know, kind of you know, almost like a zoo, you know, like of, uh, of urban chaos and disorder and that you know presented black and latino people in these neighborhoods uh, as if they were kind of like animals in this urban zoo uh, later in the 1990s on the tv show seinfeld this is another example that's talked about in the film there's a scene where kramer accidentally burns the puerto rican flag and an angry mob of parade goers damages jerry's car uh, and then Kramer says, it's like this every day in Puerto Rico. And this uh, drew complaints from Puerto Rican activists, as well as the borough president of the Bronx. Again, like kind of representing people as uh, this kind of unthinkish, unthinking, mobbish, like, you know, group of, of animals. Um. Again, the, the, the film uh, has a lot to say about the effects that these things have on children. Um, they employ, you know, like child psychologists and, and other experts uh, who work with kids to talk about like the impact that seeing these stereotypical representations, um, especially in a society like ours that is so saturated with media, um, the impact that that has on kids growing up. So the filmmakers talk with children who consume the poor representation of Latinos in the media. And many children in the film claim that they have never seen a Hispanic superhero in the media and that all of the protagonists are white. Uh, the researchers have concluded that stereotypes represented in cartoons have the most harmful effect on children. So again, like cartoons, you know, or some of the, the very first things that kids are um, exposed to. And it's also, you know, where we see this really pernicious legacy of stereotyping um, in, uh, in the media. So stereotypical representations and a lack of role models 
have detrimental impacts on the developing identities of children. Um, so when they either don't see anyone, you know, who looks like them or uh, participates, you know, as, as part of their culture or community, um, or when they do see that, but in this sort of grossly distorted, stereotypical way, it does have a real impact on kids and their sort of their uh, the confidence with which they relate to the rest of the culture and the rest of the society. They internalize a sort of a negative collective self image um, in terms of you know how other people perceive them. Um, the stereotypes that we're talking about here have uh, real world impacts in other ways. Um, and so one of the articles that you've talked, uh, we've, we've looked at um, in the last couple of weeks uh, was called Jezebel at the Welfare Office. And, and, and the findings of this article demonstrate how the enduring stereotypes that go all the way back to slavery continue to impact social policy, policy in ways that reproduce inequality. To understand how poor women's sexuality and fertility are framed during welfare office interviews, this study examined interactions about reproductive decisions and relationships between caseworkers and clients using transcripts from a multi-site study and focusing on caseworkers' language. So as we'll see in a minute, this, the, this stereotype of the Jezebel goes all the way back to the 19th century uh, in what's called the minstrel shows. Um, but it has this lasting, enduring impact as a stereotype that as this study shows, it continues to be a kind of prism through which caseworkers and social workers see their clients um, to see them, you know, in terms of these stereotypical views about poor women's sexuality and uh, fertility and reproductive decisions. So these negative myths regarding poor women's reproductive decisions and relationships are expressed in welfare offices, both through their influence on welfare policy and regulations and through the effect these myths have on worker behavior. Overall, caseworkers' language reflected negative myths regarding African-American women's sexuality and motherhood. So again, you know, to keep in mind how these uh, stereotypes that, you know, were born during times of slavery uh, continue to have this kind of lasting effect. By virtue of their status as welfare recipients, regardless of their individual races, clients were placed into racialized myths through workers' talk. This analysis demonstrates that though not present in every welfare interview and often veiled in bureaucratic language, negative ideas about poor women's sexuality persist in welfare policy and are deeply embedded in its day-to-day -day implementation. So these kind of preconceived ideas that people may not even be aware of that have filtered down through the media. We've talked about this um, with regard to the last film, The Push Out, and the criminalization of Black girls in schools. And the way, you know, similarly in which like teachers and counselors and school officers had these preconceived ideas about, you know, the anger of black girls or how they, you know, perceive them to be older than they really are. And a lot of these stereotypes are things that have been filtered down through the media and through popular culture and you know, music and film and television and, you know, the news media, all of these apparatuses of media and entertainment uphold certain kinds of uh, stereotypes 
And then those stereotypical representations have real impacts in the real world uh, in terms of policy, as we're looking at here, or in terms of school discipline, as we looked at previously. So to understand where this um, image of the Jezebel comes from, we have to go back to looking at minstrel show entertainment. Um, and this is where not only the stereotype of the Jezebel, but a lot of uh, very pernicious forms of representation um, have uh, continued to um, you know, be visible in different forms of popular culture to this day. So the minstrel show was an American form of racist theatrical entertainment that developed in the early 19th century. Each show consisted of comic skits, variety acts, dancing, and music performances that depicted people of African descent. The shows were performed by mostly white people wearing blackface makeup. Right? So this is, you know, a kind of a minstrel show in which like uh, black people and black culture are being represented, but they're being represented by uh, white actors and actresses who are, you know, in, in burnt cork on their face, like who are, who are in, in blackface. Uh, there were also some African-American performers and Black-only minstrel groups that uh, formed and toured. Um, but the, the origins of this minstrel show was definitely like as a um, uh, white performers and, and producers. Minstrel shows, uh, regardless of who was playing in them, the minstrel shows caricatured Black people as dim-witted, lazy, buffoonish, superstitious, and happy-go-lucky, um, the kind of like childlike and, and therefore incapable or not prepared for freedom. You know, they couldn't, you know, during slavery, this was the sort of dominant ideology was that you couldn't abolish slavery because Black people were just simply not prepared for or not you know mature enough as a race or something to be free uh, and so this kind of stereotype uh, and misrepresentation and, and ideology continued to be circulated through uh, this kind of minstrel show entertainment so the minstrel sh songs and, and and sketches in these uh, shows feature different stock characters based on stereotypes. Uh, the most popular of those stock characters were the slave and the dandy. Um, and then these were further divided into sub archetypes such as the mammy um, and her counterpart, the old darky, uh, the provocative mulatto wench uh, and the black soldier. So these are all like, you know, stock characters in the sense that like they were, um, you know, repeatedly represented in all of these different shows. Um, this was just like the, the stereotype that, you know, continued to be played out um, in, uh, in all kinds of different performances. So by talking about them as stock characters, we mean to emphasize that there's a certain consistency um, in the portrayal, in the stereotypical representation. Eventually, several stock characters emerged, uh, and chief among these were the slave, who often maintained the earlier name Jim Crow, and the dandy, frequently known as Zip Coon, uh, from the song of the same name. Um, and among these stereotypes is the Jezebel, as we will, were talking about uh, earlier. The Jezebel stereotype is one of the most pernicious, racist, and sexist stereotypes that have been used to rationalize and justify slavery and to spur racist and sexist perceptions and treatment of Black women. The Jezebel stereotype is synonymous with promiscuity, uh, with having an insatiable sexual appetite, 
um, and as someone who uses sex to manipulate men. The Jezebel image excused the sexual exploitation of Black women. It branded Black women as sexually promiscuous and immoral and was used to rationalize sexual atrocities. So, you know, when you look at the history of slavery in the United States, it's repeat, uh, replete with all kinds of sexual atrocities of, of rape and, and abuse. And uh, these things were, were very commonplace um, under slavery. And so as, as an ideological representation, the, the Jezebel kind of justified that or seemed to legitimate that by suggesting that black women were these sort of oversexed creatures who were, you know, kind of like asking for it in some way. Um, that was the ideological work that the, the Jezebel did to justify this, these kind of racist and sexist perceptions. Um, on the other hand, you have uh, stereotypes like the mammy. So the mammy was also a slavery era construct of black women that grossly distorts the notion of a domestic caregiver. The mammy is generally characterized as a grossly overweight, jolly, unattractive, dark complexioned woman and asexual living only to serve the master, mistress and their children. She is even neglectful of her own children and family while simultaneously overly solicitous towards whites. So the mammy is kind of the other side of the coin of the Jezebel. The Jezebel is, you know, super oversexed. The mammy is undersexed in ways that um, ideologically legitimate her domestic situation you know she's not a threat to seduce the master of the house she doesn't have her own children or her own family and so she can be you know a hundred percent committed to taking care of the master and the mistress's family um you know she and and we don't have to be concerned that she's you know, uh, being taken away from her own family because she doesn't have one. So this mammy um, stereotype continued to play out long, long after the minstrel show into uh, television programs and and films, you know, in which the mammy would, you know, appear as the, the maid or the sort of domestic caregiver of the household, you know, um, but you know, in a way where she was unlike the Jezebel, totally like desexualized in order to make her seem safe to be in a domestic environment. The quintessential mammy image is the old Aunt Jemima, the black woman wearing the kerchief on her head and wearing an apron, perpetually smiling on a, can a pancake box. Uh, and then we have a stereotype of sapphire. So sapphire is a construct that labels black women as stubborn, bitchy, bossy, and hateful. She lacks the requisite femini femininity to make her attractive to any man. The sapphire construct suggests that black women are the reason for the enmity between black men and women. The Sapphire name traces its origins to the 1950s character on the Amos and Andy show. So again, the Sapphire has a lot of uh, ideological work to play here um, in terms of justifying or legitimating why, you know, uh, the, the conflicts between black women and black men um, to deflect it from the way in which like slavery broke up families and and tore people apart and to say no the, the real reason that black men and women can't get along is because of these uh, stubborn bitchy bossy and hateful women um, so it again does this ideological work of justifying 
the system of slavery and putting the blame onto um, the victims themselves. During slavery, the standard for femininity for white women, um, which was of passivity, frailty, and domesticity, did not apply to black women. They, black women, were characterized as strong, masculinized workhorses who labored with men in the fields or as aggressive women who drove their children and partners away with their overbearing natures. The reality is that slaveholders sold black women's children and husbands away, which caused unimaginable grief and understandable anger. So again, this is the way in which uh, an ideological representation is doing the work of kind of deflecting from historical reality and putting the blame onto the victims of slavery um, and also uh, justifying their exploitation, saying like, you know, unlike white women who are too, you know, fragile and, uh, and domestic to be, to work in the fields, you know, we can put Sapphire uh, out in the fields uh, and, you know, work her, uh, like a horse, um, because like, that's just in her nature, you know? So there's a real, um, way in which you can see how, uh, these representations performed this ideological work of justifying, uh, an unequal, a, a grossly unequal system. Um, a book I uh, highly recommend, uh, if you're interested to look into these questions of, of blackface minstrelsy and, and its historical legacy. <clears throat> There's a book, book called Love and Theft, uh, Blackface Minstrelsy in the American Working Class by a historian named Eric Lott. Um, Eric Lott is, is among several historians who have analyzed minstrel entertainment as the uh, social psychology and the popular culture of white racism. So Lott combines a sort of like historical textual analysis of particular shows um, with a kind of psychological and, and at times psychoanalytic approach to understanding uh, the sort of like the, the fear and the desire and the fantasy and all of this kind of psychological projection that went into the minstrel show. Based on the appropriation of black dialect, music and dance, minstrelsy at once applauded and lampooned black culture, ironically contributing to a blackening of America. The title of Lot's book refers to a dialectic of envy as well as repulsion, sympathetic identification, as well as fear. Lot mixes psychoanalysis with cultural analysis to understand the minstrelsy as a projection of white fantasies about black people. So there's a lot here that um, is relevant for understanding what today we call cultural appropriation, you know, which is this kind of um, mixture of, as Lot says, envy and repulsion, uh, sympathetic identification, as well as fear the way in which uh, black culture or other non-white cultures are kind of exoticized and seen as authentic or more real or more street um, and are then kind of appropriated um, in music and dance and entertainment uh, in these ways, you know, that lead um, lot to, to talk about the blackening of American culture. But it's really like, as, as what Lot says, it's really an act of, of projection that, you know, tells us little or nothing about actual black people or black culture and, and tells us everything about white uh, people and white audiences and white people who consume this kind of entertainment um, and the ways in which they are kind of projecting their their fears and their fantasies and, and projecting them onto black culture and black people um, in this way that that is really actually a lot more revealing about you know 
uh, what white people think and feel and and uh, fear. Uh, and that's sort of Lot's approach to the to the book and and to looking at minstrel entertainment in this kind of social psychological kind of way. Uh, very interesting text that that I, that I recommend. Um, these uh, stereotypes continued to sort of um, endure and play out and, and then find new forms in, in Hollywood film um, and then later in, in radio and, and television. Um, but the, the, the sort of the film that kind of kicked it all off in 1915, uh, The Birth of a Nation, uh, was one that really took a lot of these minstrel show archetypes and put them uh, into the, onto the Hollywood screen. The Birth of a Nation is a 1915 American silent epic drama directed by D.W. Griffith. Uh, the screenplay is adapted from uh, Thomas Dixon Jr.'s 1905 novel and play called The Klansman. And it is generally considered the first uh, blockbuster film. It's a film that was like over two hours at a time when you know films were still much shorter than that, and it, and it was a real kind of epic uh, drama in terms of you know the, the number of people that were involved in in filming it, and these has these huge uh, battle scenes, and you know is is really a, a film that was um, uh, that, that kind of pushed the envelope in terms of like what a movie could do as entertainment. Um, but it also, you know, incorporated all of these enduring stereotypes. So the film has been denounced for its racist depiction of African-Americans. The film portrays its black characters, uh, again, many of whom are played by white actors in blackface, as unintelligent and uh, also as sexually aggressive towards white women. Whereas the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK, is portrayed as a heroic force necessary to preserve American values, protect white women, and maintain white supremacy. So yeah, in, in this film, the KKK are presented as like the good guys who ride in on their horses to save uh, white people from the horrors of uh, reconstruction and uh, racial equality. Um, and in particular, a major theme of the film is like rescuing white women from black men. Um, the sort of undercurrent, you know, the, the, the not so subtle message of the film throughout is that, you know, slavery, had, the end of slavery has sort of uh, unleashed all of these black men uh, to go and prey upon, uh, you know, defenseless, fragile white women. And you need something like the KKK to come in and, and save the day. Um, that's, you know, in, in essence, the, the sort of the plot of the film. Um, the Birth of a Nation was a huge commercial success across the nation. Uh, it grossed more than any other previous motion picture, and it profoundly influenced both the film industry and American culture. The film has been acknowledged also as an inspiration for the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan, which took place only a few months after its release. The Birth of a Nation was the first movie shown in the White House. It was attended by President Woodrow Wilson, members of his family and members of his cabinet. Wilson said of the film, it is like writing history with lightning. And my only regret is that it is all so terribly true. So, you know, this was a film that is enormously controversial by our standards now. <laughs> but was really a huge blockbuster success that was shown, you know, the first movie shown in the White House uh, and that the president loved and, you know, thought it was all true. Um, and it also had this real life impact as far as sparking, sparking 
um, what we call the second uh, generation of the, the KKK. The Ku Klux Klan experiences a huge rebirth going into the into the 1920s actually became even stronger than it had been, you know, in its original inception after uh, slavery and during Reconstruction. The KKK, you know, in the 1920s, you know, became, um, you know, even more powerful than it had been before. And it this was a, a sort of a direct result of this film. So it's not one of those these kinds of things where you, you can't just say, well, it's just a movie. It's not real. But, but it, it's a movie that had this sort of real impact um, in American society at the time. So um, we can sort of take things a little bit, you know, more into the present uh, to think about how media stereotypes have um legitimated and contributed to what we talked about in the previous video lecture as the new Jim Crow, um, as a uh, mass incarceration that is uh, racially disproportionate in terms of uh, who is being uh, locked up and for how long, um, particularly because of the war on drugs. So media stereotypes of people of color supported this rise of mass incarceration and the new Jim Crow in the 80s and 90s. Both the news media and popular entertainment have overrepresented people of color as violent, deviant, and criminal, uh, thus legitimating greater policing and social control. Um, here you see some headlines from the case uh, around um, the five teenagers who would be arrested in New York who came to be known as the Central Park Five. Uh, there had been a uh, rape of a and brutal beating of a white woman who was jogging in Central Park one night. Uh, I think this was in 1989. And uh, this sort of mass, you know, hysterical panic and anger uh, that led to these kind of headlines uh, in the newspapers, like you see here. And it ultimately led to the conviction of these five teenage boys, all of whom were uh, Black or Puerto Rican. And uh, it turned out that they were innocent um, years and years later. DNA evidence basically exonerated those five and they were released from prison, but not after having spent, you know, 15 or 20 years or whatever it had been, and were just totally vilified in the media, uh, were vilified by Donald Trump. Donald Trump took out a million dollar advertisement in the newspapers to call for the death penalty to be reinstituted for minors just so that they these kids could be executed um and they hadn't even been convicted yet um and they were convicted in a totally railroaded kind of way where they're you know kind of like coerced confessions um in which like the nypd kind of manipulated and scared them into confessing into these crime into this crime that they didn't commit so this hysteria um, around this, you know, Central Park case is just emblematic of uh, things that were happening throughout this age of mass incarceration in which there was just all this kind of fear mongering, um, especially around bra uh, black and brown youth uh, and their criminality, um, you know, people like Hillary Clinton, you know, talked about like super predators, you know, like, uh, you know, young uh, drug dealers and and gang members, you know, that she called super predators uh, were people that, you know, needed to have like, you know, you know, throw the book at them and, you know, lock them up and throw away the key. This became kind of the attitude of people as they became inundated with these fears of crime. And the media played a major role 
in like throwing gasoline on the fire and and really you know um stoking those fears uh especially about young black and brown men uh in the inner cities uh now this was a a, a bit of a shift in terms of the stereotyping because during slavery stereotypes had depicted black men as docile and childlike um, and thus incapable of freedom. So, as we saw with the, the minstrel show, you know, more often in the minstrel show, you know, the, the dandy or, you know, like Zip Coon or these kind of characters were just kind of, they weren't like violently criminal. They were just kind of like dumb and lazy and naive and, you know, like uncivilized. Um, and therefore, you know, incapable of freedom and equality, but not like dangerously criminal. Um, after slavery, the stereotype shifts more and more towards this image of violent criminality. After slavery, Black men were more often stereotyped as violent, as criminal, um, and as also as sexually aggressive. Uh, as we saw with the, you know, the Birth of a Nation film, the idea that black men were sexually aggressive towards white women um, helped to legitimate the revival of the Ku Klux Klan. The idea that you know you needed this kind of vigilante force in order to protect innocent and pure white women from these thuggish black, black men who were trying to prey upon them. Um, so all of this kind of serves to legitimate the need for some kind of enhanced social control and policing. Um, in the new Jim Crow era, there's a lot of examples that I could point to from as far as films and, and television um, and, uh, you know, in, in, in music and, and in, you know, advertising and all kinds of popular media. But the one that I think probably had the most negative impact in terms of legitimating mass incarceration and the new Jim Crow uh, was the show Cops. Uh, the, the, the Cops is among the longest running TV shows in U.S. history. Uh, although it was briefly canceled in 2020 around the time of the George Floyd protests, um, it got renewed and is now in its 35th season. So um, at the time of COPS's inception, the U.S. was right in the middle of this war on drugs, which led to the militarization of the police and higher incarceration rates as I talked about in the last video lecture. And whereas cops purported to be a reality show, you know, just showing it like it is, uh, in reality, the show was highly edited to emphasize violence, danger, and deviance. Its dominant frame shows the police as the thin blue line holding back the violence and chaos of American cities. So this is why, you know, we refer to cops as a form of propaganda. That is to say, like propaganda that is, you know, legitimating uh, the police, legitimating cops and legitimating this kind of get tough approach um, because the dominant frame is looking at the cities uh, and, you know, inner city neighborhoods as these you know, uh, the, these urban jungles um, in which there is just chaos and deviance and therefore the population needs to be uh, controlled and, and imprisoned and, you know, in one way or another, the police are necessary to impose order and civilization in what is, in what is otherwise a uh, chaotic um, urban jungle. So that was, you know, sort of the, you know, the persistent theme of cops as a show, you know, show after show after show in terms of like where it was situated and, and how it was edited 
you know, all these things uh, were very selective, whereas, you know, cops purported to be like a, a reality show that was just kind of showing the way things really were. Um, in fact, it was definitely like, you know, kind of selectively uh, framed in order to emphasize certain kinds of narratives and, and imagery and uh, cultural beliefs. A couple of studies have been done um, by media scholars and social scientists and, and others um, about cops and uh, about, you know, specifically like what kinds of people are, are you know, tend to be uh, depicted on cops. So researchers at Old Dominion University videotaped 16 episodes of cops and then evaluated them from, for crime content and for the race and gender of characters depicted. And the study found that on cops, African-American men were overwhelmingly shown as perpetrators, usually of violent crimes. And Hispanic men, though less often depicted, were also were usually depicted as violent criminals. On the other hand, the police officers depicted were overwhelmingly white, and the disproportionately few white offenders were more often portrayed as involved in nonviolent offenses. In some, African American and Hispanic men appear far more responsible for crime than they actually are in the US population at large. So that's what we say when we mean there's a kind of a disproportionate emphasis on the crimes committed by people of color in urban inner city neighborhoods. Um, so it's not like cops is like making this stuff up or, you know, inventing this out of thin air. It's more like, you know, like kind of like one of those distorted funhouse mirrors that you might see, you know, at the, at the fair or, or, you know, something like that, where like certain parts are, you know, like where it's a mirror image, but certain parts are kind of blown up and distorted and other parts are minimized. Um, and so it's a, it's a representation, it's an image of a real thing, but it's a distorted image. It's a distorted representation and it's distorted in a really selective kind of way that ideologically affirms these kinds of narratives about violent criminality uh, in inner city neighborhoods. A uh, second study that was done in 2004, um, the researchers utilized a random sample of 81 anecdotes from cops ep episodes, analyzing their content, subjects, and characters. And again, they concluded, uh, much like the previous study, that the program was racially skewed, negative misre negatively re me misrepresenting African Americans who were depicted as a criminal class out of proportion to their actual percentage of US crime in particular. So again, a kind of disproportionate representation in terms of uh, the reality of crime and the way that crime as it appears on the show Cops. Uh, on Cops is much more likely to see uh, black and Latino men as perpetrators of violent crime, uh, much more likely to see that on cops than in the reality uh, of social life. So the study indicated that the cops episodes appeared to selectively edit out failed police efforts. So this is the other half of copaganda. Um, it's not only that the the bad guys are really bad and therefore they need controlling. It's also like the, the the cops, the good guys, like never fail. Like you never see, you know, on these shows instances where the police, you know, fail to get their guy or make a mistake or, you know, act out of order. Um, the this is the the other side of the coin as far as uh, copaganda is concerned. The study's authors expressed concern that this 
just that this provided TV viewers with implicit and misleading justification for police actions that amounted to racism, discrimination, or profiling. So yeah, if, if you're just like, if your sense of like law and order issues just comes from like turning on the TV uh, and watching cops on the Fox network, you're going to see a world in which like, you know, the inner cities are just out of control and people are acting like animals. And on the other hand, you know, you have these virtuous police officers who, you know, are the only thing that's holding that chaos back from, you know, invading into your nice, safe suburb or, you know, wherever it is that you're, you know, watching the television program from. Again, um, just as we talked about with Jezebel at the welfare office and and also when it comes to um, the uh, birth of a nation and the rebirth of the KKK, these kinds of media have real life impacts. Uh, they have impacted society um, and they're not just media and entertainment. They're not just like escapist fantasies but they are rather things that do have these real world effects. And so the impact of cops um, was, you know, such that uh, cops was filmed in more than 140 cities over the course of its 30 years on television, police departments granted permission to the program to film in their areas and had approval rights over the footage. In many cases, police departments asked cops to come and film in their town or city in order to assist with rebranding their reputation and as a means to recruit new officers. Uh, in other words, again, as copaganda. Um, cops was terrific PR for police departments, said Dan Simon, professor of law and psychology at the University of Southern California Gould School of Law. So it actually, like a whole new generation of kids were like watching cops on TV and like wanted to become cops themselves. That's what they mean as far as like uh, that this was a tool to recruit new officers um, and to, you know, also to rebrand their reputation, you know, to again, like to present them in a positive light as the good guys who are maintaining order in uh, environments that would otherwise be, you know, chaos and anarchy. So again, like the impact of uh, these media forms of these mediated forms of entertainment, um, you know, they, they actually have a real impact in uh, society. Okay, so um, with the, the next lecture, we're going to kind of turn towards, um, we're going to kind of continue on with looking at like culture and media and language. Um, and we'll turn to looking at sort of how other racial and ethnic groups have been stereotyped in the media and culture and sort of broaden out the discussion that way. Um, but for now, I'm going to stop the share and uh, I'll see you next time. Bye.